Chapter 2, The Problem with Spore Everything dripped, oozed, or was host to a tenacious slime that invaded every surface. The trickle of liquid and slow percussive drops of water intensified the dank humid silence of the cavern. There was no stone, no rock or sand. This place was hollowed from a century of things abandoned and unwanted. Great sodden heaps of compacted paper formed the walls, crusted over with black and grey-green drippings. The floor was an ankle-deep mush over a treacherous jumble of broken masonry. Overhead a tangle of beams and ancient crates. The rusting hulk of a caterpillar tracked bulldozer hung incongruously. A little light glowed from a wide slit tucked under the ceiling, a fine dust dancing in the water-saturated air. The faintest yellow-green fungus glow. Newspapers, bundled, stacked, fallen and tumbled. Pile after pile, leaning, slumping, stinking. From every stack bracket fungus grew, the smallest the size of a baby's palm. Layer after layer, white, broad hard skin on top, spongy and pregnant with brown spores below. Plate-sized, dustbin lid-sized, large as a table. Stacked on every side, a larger fungus always just beyond the limit of sight in this eternal gloom. On the furthest wall from the sunlit slit, a monstrous shelf, a fungus ancient and gnarled. Its roots bound and penetrated a colossal block of paper. Consumed and compacted, it was impossible to determine where fungus ended and ancient paper still remained. Eel bodies writhed through the soupy slurry, silent hunters. A cockroach dashed from its snug recess, spurred by an unseen threat. It skittered along a narrow spar resting on the watery surface. A slash of movement, large fishy eyes, and a mouthful of needle teeth. The slurry used back, smoothing the surface. The eel and the cockroach were gone. The silence returned, to be broken moments later by scuffling sounds from outside the sun-tinged entrance. A squat heavily built man laid on his belly, his back sliding just under the high ceiling. His legs reached down for a concrete nub. The foothold found, he pulled himself through the narrow gap and clambered down, confidently trusting his weight to the first large bracket fungus on his descent to the floor of the cavern. His steel-soled boots left imprints in the fungus. It squelched with every step, the first footsteps slowly refilling as he stepped down to the flooded floor. Edgar Hench sloshed through the swamp, keeping to the smoother sections memorized through many hundreds of traversals. He ducked under the furled edge of the largest fungus. Rolling onto a raised wooden pallet, he surveyed the spore-rich underside. As he suspected, the area within easy reach was still sparse, recovering from earlier harvests. Grunting, he turned onto his belly and crawled further under the overhanging fungus, dragging his bucket behind him. He positioned himself under a fine rich spongy outcrop, loaded with ripe spores ready to drop. Edgar tugged at the rope attached to the bucket. The bucket wouldn't budge. Annoyed, he sat up and gave the rope a good pull. The bucket jerked free of the edge of the pallet. It flew through the air and sailed over his head. He looked up just as the rim of the bucket sliced into the spongy mass. He held his breath as he was deluged by a torrent of dust finer than flour. Frantically, he beat it out of his hair and off of his face, knowing that he had already ingested a heroic dose of the hallucinogenic spores. Glumly, he scooped the spores and loose found the sponge into the bucket, filling it and packing it down. As he secured the lid, he saw the corpse light dancing in the walls, the fungus enhancing his vision to pick up the faintest traces of light from the bodies, animal and human, mouldering in their waxy coating just behind the walls of the cave. Edgar shuddered and lay down. He focused on the rough pallet wood just in front of him. May as well wait it out, Henge, you old fool. Ain't the first time, won't be the last. The texture of the mottled dirty wood swirled, forming patterns that swam and span. He fancied that he saw a pattern like a map of the village. There was a tower of the abbey, Primrose, and Shamrock Streets, the market square. The notion took root in his mind, and the village became ever clearer to his sight. Well, that's better than some foolishness you've seen. Market day tomorrow. Mustn't forget. He fell into a pleasant stupor, waiting for the effect of the spores to pass. Edgar Henge's head pounded from the lingering ravages of yesterday's accidental deluge of fungus spores. He'd have to be careful today, testing everything he saw. Nothing could be taken on trust. He shook his head, cursing his clumsiness. 
The colored lights that sometimes swelled and slowly faded were easy to dismiss. They moved when he turned his head, stayed in his vision when his eyes were closed. Inconvenient, slightly nauseating, but the worst effect was that they obscured things in the real world that he wanted to see. More troubling were the phantasms, the things conjured entirely within his mind. He paused as he walked through the churchyard, looking for the recurring illusion that seemed to haunt this place. He saw it only when the poison from the spores raged through his veins, the image of a young woman's face. He shifted the heavy packs, easing the strain on his shoulders. He was torn between lingering in the hope of seeing her and hurrying on to the market to be rid of his load. He stood in the junction of four paths and slowly turned, peering past a bloom of blue-pink light that smeared across the bottom of his vision. Nothing under the yew tree, a place where he had often seen the illusion. The benches all seemed empty, nothing standing behind them either. He peered into the darkness between the abbey's deep white buttresses. Disappointed, he turned to take the path leading down into the northern edge of the village. He froze. Something prickled his thoughts, something he had missed. He whirled around as fast as his heavy load and stocky body would allow. There was a faint fuzziness in front of a stone angel standing guard over a grave marker. He squinted, completely focused on the phenomenon. There, a face in front of the angel's head. An elfin, and smiling face regarding him, with wide dark eyes, and arched eyebrows on a flawless brow. Heart racing, he took quick steps forward. He stumbled slightly as his foot fell awkwardly on the ridge of stone separating the path from the graveyard grass. When he looked up he saw only the briefest movement, as if the face had turned, and in turning had left this world. Oh, well, if you're a conjuring of my own drug-addled imagination, you could at least stay around for a chat sometime. He thought for a while. Mind you, I'd only be talking to myself, as usual. I wouldn't talk to me either, if I had a choice. I can barely get a civil word out of me. The village was unexpectedly crowded. The narrow cobbled lanes choked with people pushing towards the village central market square. The few who were trying to leave had to fight their way against the tide. Edgar Henge hesitated. He turned from the unaccustomed crush of humanity and took a few steps back along the cobbled road. He looked up the long slope. His home was just visible beyond a mile of dense forest. The dirty white cottage near the top of the natural hill nestled at the base of the clay-covered dome of the centuries-old landfill site. The wind rolled down the hill towards him, bringing, he was sure, the faintest aroma of decay and corruption overlaying the scent of the forest pine. Edgar had bathed in the millpond below his home and changed into his market close before walking down to the village. He was self-consciously aware that he carried something of the stench of the pit with him, though his nose was blind to it. He hefted the bag slung over his shoulder. He had gathered a fair weight of marketable treasures. He balanced his dislike of people against the prospect of carrying his load back up the long slope. With a resigned grunt, he turned again and joined the line of people trudging slowly into the market square. A woman looked back at him, annoyed when his heavy pack bumped into her side. Her face softened. Oh, hello Mr. Henge, come to see the flogging. He shook his head, trying but failing to remember the woman's name. Can't say I've heard anything. Just brought a few things to sell at market. The ink cancelled at half the, Mrs. Lumpet, Jeannie Lumpet. Me and Bert brought you a couple of pheasants last my commerce, remember. Though you were proper poorly. Seemed a bit dazed now I think of it. No, hasn't been cancelled. Going to be a lot of buyers and sellers here today. Not often one of the toffs gets flogged for a breach of the law. There was talk of a burning for a while, but the right hand of the law shut that down. I dare say coin changed hands, if you know what I mean. Hench nodded. Funny how that sometimes happens. Hard coin softens the firm hand of the law. Mrs. Lumpet gave him a quizzical look, then quickly changed the subject. So what have you got today? Anything fancy? He shrugged. Some oil and spirits, a few keepsakes and treasures. Natural oil or home brew. This is the good stuff. Real old black liquid oil. Filtered and purified. Good for lamps, if you must. Even better for keeping machines running sweet and smooth. Too fancy for me. We don't have anything that needs more than lard or beeswax. Who can afford metal these days? Not us, that's for sure. 
Oh, looks like we're through. Good luck. Henge had forgotten Ginny Lumpet already. He saw Trader Josh's flag bedecked stand across the way. Suddenly worried that his pocket had been pecked, Henge grasped the buttoned inner pocket of his jacket. He felt the few scraps of gold he had found since his last time in the village on market day. Reassured, he struck out through the crowded market space. Trader Josh always had the best location in the market. He was set up in the open space underneath the wood-framed guild hall. The hall had many visitors on market days. Everyone who entered walked between Josh's two stalls. The rightmost stall contained a fascination of rare and exotic objects, all displayed on stands that folded ingeniously out from Josh's cart. The cart itself was heavy. It took a team of two muscular Pacheran horses to draw it, horses that were enjoying the day's rest eating their fill in the fine pasture behind the abbey. Hench saw Trader Josh leaning against one of the hall's columns, his back to his market stalls where two of his oversized siblings were selling goods to the relatively diminutive village folk. Hench turned to see what Josh was looking at over the heads of the crowd. There was a raised platform in the centre of the square. A young lad in simple linen shirt and black tricer stood shivering despite the mildness of the morning. He was tethered by a short length of rope to a law enforcement officer. The officer seemed to be giving quiet words of encouragement. Josh imagined he could read over soon. Don't fret lad on the lips of the officer. The boy nodded and steeled himself, raising his chin. Josh sniffed as Henge approached, seeming to detect a slight change in the air. He said good morning, Edgar. Henge was still a short distance away, approaching from the side, where Josh's hat was tilted against the early morning sun. He sniffed his sleeve quickly before answering. Morning to you too, trader. Lots of folk in town today. Business should be good. Josh nodded. I'm not going to complain about it. We had a line at the stalls even before we finished setting up. Let's see how many stick around after the judgment. Henge just wanted to offload his wares and leave this heaving mass of people behind, but he knew that the unwritten social rules dictated that he should spend a minute or two talking of inconsequential things. I, I heard something was going on. I don't think I've seen so many people here at one time in years. There must be two, maybe three hundred at least. Big event for a place like Undertour. Josh pulled a clay pipe from his pocket and thoughtfully packed it with leaf. You'll recognise the lad on the platform. Hen shook his head, and Josh explained. Henry, youngest son of Lord Malin, got caught trying to get a computing device to work. Henge, who had barely been paying attention, looked up sharply. What manner of device? Where did he get it? Josh regarded him calmly for a moment, lighting his pipe before replying. Just some kind of phone, I think. Said he had heard that kids used to play games with them. Of course he didn't get anywhere with it, had it open. But most of the guts of the thing had rotted away. Hen shrugged. That's usually the way, so I hear. But you've no idea where he got it. My guess is that he bought it from some tinker on the road, but he won't give up a name. That's probably why they're going to flog him. The kid has some steel to him, have to give him that. Henge whistled. Son of a lord, eh? I'm surprised the whole thing didn't get quietly forgotten. That's mailing for you. Takes his oath to the law very seriously, turned the kid in himself. Brutal. Anyway, I have some things here you'll probably like. Did you bring any spore? I'm running low on snuff. Henge had collected more than ten pounds the previous day, and had spent a woozy couple of hours cleaning and milling it into heavy brown cake. The traders would mix it with herbs and mint oil before baking and grinding it. The village's many snuff users bought the mild stimulant in half-ounce tins. The law keepers quietly ignored the furtive snuff takers. Their faces turned to a wall as they sharply inhaled a pinch. Hench never brought too much spore to market, knowing that its scarcity kept the price higher. I've got two pounds of spore for you right here. Collected it fresh yesterday. Got a face full of the stuff, was completely off me head for a while. Josh laughed. Never tried it raw. Not much of a user wit cut down into snuff either. And that's pretty mild. How is it? Hench gave a non-committal wobble of his hand. I've been collecting the stuff since I was a nipper. You get kind of desensitized to it. Only tell me, that's not an enormous spider under your cart with half a dozen flaming red eyes, is it? Josh gave a start and looked where Edgar was pointing. 
he roared with laughter. No, my friend, that's my dog. Only the four legs and two eyes. Dopey brown ones, not flaming red. Desensitized or not, you've still got it bad. Not so bad I can't count coin, trust me on that, my friend. Josh squeezed Edgar's shoulder before turning and calling to one of his workers. Kate, when you've got a moment, see what Edgar hears for sale, will you? Give him friends and family prices. The proceedings on the central stage had started, with the senior law enforcement officer settled into what promised to be a long sermon. After exchanging his goods for a modest sum, Edgar tipped his hat to Traitor Josh and started for the nearest exit from the market square. Josh called after him, will you not stay for the full ceremony? I'll not. I have no stomach for the suffering of others. There's more than enough to go around. We needn't be adding to it. Josh did not react, and Henge slipped quietly away. As Henge passed out of sight, Josh muttered under his breath, Take care, hermit. Some may take issue with your lack of faith in the lore. As the first lash of the flail hit home, Josh was on the far side of his cart underneath the guild hall, suddenly finding that he urgently needed to inspect the goods brought by Edgar. 